But I'll bring your first speaker up, uh, a research fellow at Moffitt Cancer Center, a PhD, which I found out last night doesn't mean player haters degree, from Trinity College in Dublin. Trinity College or university? Uh, Trinity College Dublin, but it is a university. We just like to confuse people. Okay, uh, it's both. It's uh, Trinity. It's Trinity. Okay, it's a, it's a PhD. It's a big deal. I barely graduated high school, so a PhD is like that's no. Uh, let's give it up for Shadeen Ahern. Okay. I don't know. Does this work? Can you all hear me with this? No. Okay. Oh, this is for you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, obviously, this is my first time doing anything like this. Um, okay, so um, as Law mentioned, um, my name is Sinead, and I'm actually part of the organizing committee for this year's Point of Science. And so um, I only heard about the concept this year, and I was like, well, it's pretty cool, so I may as well put my money where my mouth is and give a talk. And then last night, I was like, oh, um, why did I say that I would do this? Because um, I've, I've given, obviously, I'm a scientist. I've given talks to other scientists, always with a PowerPoint presentation. And I've actually given talks to people who aren't scientists, but also with a PowerPoint presentation. But this is my first time doing anything like this with just me standing here. And I, I was thinking, how am I going to explain to you all <laughs> Ooh, yes. Um, how am I going to explain to you all the really specific area of cancer research that I do? Yes. I just maybe I should just hit them all now. <laughs> um, how will I explain this to you without any pictures or without anything? So um, I decided to try and do it this way. I decided to uh, tell you guys how how I became a scientist and how. I discovered this area of research and then along the way hopefully tell you about what it is. So to tell you how I became a scientist I'm going to bring you back to when I was in school and you might be thinking that now I'm going to tell you all like oh my god when I was a kid I loved science I had set up experiments in the garage and I did it all the time and that actually I don't want to disappoint you but that was like not me at all. And when I was in school, I actually had no clue what I wanted to do at all. And I, when faced with this like first world problem of like, oh my God, I have so many opportunities, which one will I pick? Um, I was like, oh God, like which one will I pick? And I really flipped and flopped around between uh, air hostess to uh, lawyer to interior design to architect to really exasperating my parents to the extent that they went, we need to get a professional in to help this girl because I'm, I'm the oldest of four, so they had no clue what to do with me. So they brought me to this man who's like this career guy. He will sort your life out. He, you go to, it's like a whole weekend, you spend about nine hours doing aptitude tests to figure out which kind of brain you have, like do you do engineering, are you good spatially aware, do, are you more arty? And then he like interviews you for like three hours with this binder of careers. And then you go off and I was like, this is gonna, this is gonna solve all my problems. You come back with your parents and he goes, okay, I've got two conclusions. The first one is um, you have the aptitude to do whatever you want. You are equally into everything. And the second conclusion is you are thoroughly confused as to what you want to do, you have no idea. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, you're actually telling me instead of narrowing my options to think about things that I haven't even thought about yet. I was like, no, like, no. So I may, I may have gone a little dramatic and been like, like for the love of God, just pick, help me pick something. So he went, okay, you're doing two science subjects in school. Um, why don't you just like do science degree and like, see what happens? And I was like, science? Like, is that a job? Like, what? Um, <laughs> I was like, are scientists just like old guys in a lab like with no mates? I was like, mm, okay, I'll think about it. And so 
I thought about it and it was kind of logical so and I had no better plan so off I skipped to university to do uh, a science degree and so began my illustrious science career. Um, but in, in university I did a, a general degree and I did loads of different topics from zoology to microbiology to plant biology, chemistry, physics, maths and the thing that really um, grabbed my attention was uh, genetics and molecular biology. And so we learned like loads of things, loads of really interesting things about evolution and inheritance of traits and also about molecular biology of the cell. So I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about that for a little bit because that feeds into what I'm actually doing now. And so when I was thinking about how to explain this, I was looking up online and I found this kind of cool analogy that I adapted a little bit for myself. And it's to do with baking, because I like to bake cakes. So um, everybody knows that all your, your body is made up of loads of cells. And all the cells contain DNA. And so what I want you to do is think of the DNA like a giant recipe book. It's a recipe book for life. DNA, we say, is the, the code for life. It contains all the information. And we have a lot of DNA. But d imagine DNA is this giant recipe book. And the individual recipes in the book are your genes. So they code for a specific recipe for a specific product. And so there's this central concept in molecular biology. And that's that DNA is made into RNA, is made into proteins. RNA, RNA yay. Um, and so if you imagine DNA is this huge recipe book full of all your recipes that are your genes, but it's actually in a foreign language that you can't understand. So in, a, in, in order for you to make like a lovely cake or something, you need to translate the recipe into English so you can understand it. So this kind of translated version that's English is your RNA. And once you've got your RNA, you can get everything together to make the final product, which is your cake or your protein. So traditionally, scientists were really interested in, in proteins because they're the, the, they call them the building blocks of life. They're the things in the cells that actually do things. So once they're made, they can become a part of the structure of the cell or maybe um, create a signal to tell the cell to grow or to stop growing or to die or whatever. And um, so traditionally, scientists were, were interested in the proteins and in the DNA because the DNA is the code of everything, but not so much the RNA. And this RNA, it was called messenger RNA because it's, it's just the message, really. So they were like, yeah, it's important. I mean, you can't get the protein without the RNA, but, you know, whatever. Um, and so we were learning all about this. And I was in college, actually, at a, a pretty interesting time. And it was the time that they released the paper, the seminal paper, in which they published, sorry, in which they published the human genome, the first sequence of the human genome. And my professors were like really excited about this because it was a massive deal in science at the time. It took scientists all around the world at least 13 years to do this. And there was hundreds of scientists spending billions of dollars to do it. So it was a huge deal when they actually published it. And they were telling us at the time, you know, before they started it, um, they had some kind of predictions as to what they thought would be in the actual human genome. And, so, and the one that kind of stuck with me the most was based on the amount of DNA that a human cell has. So a human cell has a, an awful lot of DNA. I think I read somewhere if you, if you stretched up the DNA from one cell into like a linear form, it'd be two meters tall. Or to translate into American, uh, 6.5 <laughs> feet tall. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty tall from one cell. So they, we have a lot of DNA, and, and we learned that we're one of the most kind of highly evolved beings on the planet. We're, you know, so dominant ecologically anyway. We're the, we're the top dog. So they estimated that based on the amount of DNA that we have, we'd have at least 100,000 genes. And then when they actually sequenced everything, they found out that we actually only have 20 or 30,000 which is quite a large discrepancy if you think about it. And at the time, uh, my professors were just like, oh yeah, um, you know, that's just junk DNA. Don't worry about it, don't think about it. Um, it's junk, doesn't matter. And I remember sitting in the lecture going, um, 
But you just said, like, evolution and everything, like survival of the fittest. Like, we, we only keep things that make us more effective as a species to survive. Why would most of our DNA not do anything? But at the time, I was like, like 19 or something, so I was like, junk DNA, question mark. And then I forgot about it. Um, so anyway, I really enjoyed learning all this stuff in college. And I, because I was so interested in genetics, I, I did pretty well. I came like top of my class in my third year. And like, they don't make a big deal about it. In, well, they didn't in my university. They just send you a letter in the mail and go, well done. Um, uh, here's a scholarship and like, keep, keep it up. Um, but because of that, uh, one of the faculty members in the university reached out to me and asked me if I'd ever considered doing a PhD. And I really hadn't. I was like, oh, right, yeah, more, more college. <laughs> really. Um, but I did start to think about it. Um, but the only thing was that the PhD that he offered me wasn't, wasn't super interesting to me. And that was because it was looking at um, the products of fungus. And I, I don't know if you guys have ever been into a microbiology lab, but it really, 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 really smells bad. Like, I mean, it's the kind of smell that like hits you in the back of the throat. And like, you can kind of taste it for about five minutes after you like leave the room. It's like really horrendous. And I was a little shallow and that like it fed into my decision, but also because like I couldn't really see like, I didn't want to be the like fungus girl. Like, it's important research, but I just was like, it's, it's not speaking to me. But it made me think about, oh, maybe PhD is a good idea. So, and, and what do I really want to do? And I've never, ever wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, I just, I'm not good at, like, things being kind of disgusting near me. Um, so I wouldn't make people feel better at all. But I kind of came upon the idea of, like, what if I could do some research, though, that might actually help people? That could be pretty cool. So I found this PhD in, in Trinity College called a PhD in Molecular Medicine. And I applied for that. And I got it. And <clears throat> I'm a believer as well in that y your career and your life are, are, are kind of one and the same. They're shaped by each other. And, and I had a huge life event that happened when I first um, started this PhD. And, and that was that my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And for every family that has a, a cancer diagnosis, it's a terrifying time. Like, it's really like everything stops and you're very worried. And my, my worry was really compounded at the time because I was going to these lectures by professors about cancer and disease. And all you hear at the start of every cancer talk is about how bad it is, how many people die, and how hopeless the whole thing is. And I was just sitting there going, oh my god, this is awful. Um, I hope my mom's going to be okay. And she is okay. It's like 11 years later, she's, she's fine. Um, but it really made me think. I was like, if it's so terrible, like, this is clearly like, something I should do. If I can do research in this, I'm going to do it. And so I, I did. I found a project that was on cancer. It was on thyroid cancer, but it was on these small RNAs. And I'm, I'm sure you were thinking, like, get to the point. Like, this is supposed to be at small RNAs. So this is what I started to work on. And so now I'm going to tell you what these small RNAs are. And to do that, I'm going to tell you how they were discovered. And they were discovered back in 1993 by two groups that were working together. And these groups were working on uh, worms. And um, why were they working on worms? I, I don't really know. They loved worms. Um, and <laughs> what they were really interested in is how the worms developed. So they really wanted to know, as a worm goes from like an, a little egg thing to a full worm, what genes get turned on at what times to make the head the head and the butt, or as we say in Ireland, the arse, the arse. <laughs> so they were really interested in this like head arse axis, let's call it. And um, they wanted to know what genes were in charge of this. And what they found was this tiny little RNA. So remember I told you that the RNA is is the message part. It's the part that the DNA is translated into so you can use it. But what they found was that there was these tiny RNAs that were really way, way smaller than a usual one um, that were impacting this worm head tail axis. And 
and that actually the, these little RNAs didn't make a protein. And they went, what? <laughs> no protein. Um, so they published this in 1993, and they were like, oh my god, we're going to be superstars. This is amazing. And then everyone else went, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool, but like, is it, it's in worms, right? Someone just said worms. It's like, nobody cares about worms, guys, except you. Um, and so they were like, no, this is really important. Like, so pretty much the scientific community ignored it. They, like, it was, in a, it was a high impact paper, it was in Cell, which is major, but everyone else went, yeah, it's just in worms, we don't care. Um, so they, but they were like, no, this is important. We're gonna, we're gonna keep figuring this out. And they worked on it for another seven years and published like maybe one or two papers a year and really like struggled to figure it out. On, and <coughs> everyone just kept ignoring them. Until in, in 2000, they published another paper, and they were like, guys, we found another one. And everyone was like, yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> and they were like, no, guess what? It's in flies. And we're like, yeah, right, <laughs> flies. Um, and they were like, it's in humans too. And then it was like, drop the mic, walk out. <laughs> everyone went, yes, oh my god, this is amazing. This is a whole new level of gene regulation. And since then, like, if you look up the papers online, it's like, Massive. And so, from what this one little worm uh, head arse important RNA, it's turned into this massive field of study. And now they've shown that these small RNAs are thought to regulate up to 30% of the genes in the human genome. And not only that, one of these can regulate up to over 100 targets, 100 proteins, with just one changing. So this is like a really big deal, but not only that, they've been uh, shown to be important for pretty much all cell functions. So the cell to grow, for the cell to die, for the cell to, for, for the cell to become a stem cell, stay a stem cell, they, they are, have been shown to be really important for all of that. And so once that was kind of figured out, people were like, well, if they're so important for, for things to survive, so they've shown that Animals without micro RNAs or these small RNAs, often they die or they can't reproduce. So they're pretty fundamental to life. So if they're so fundamental, they, what happens in a disease context? And it turns out, if you look at cancer, which is my area, every single cancer that they've ever studied, these have been altered in. Every single one. I've never seen a paper that says, oh, we looked at this cancer and there's no change in the microRNAs. And so they've done a lot of work um, in looking at different cancers. And my, my PhD project was looking at thyroid cancer, which is, is not a very lethal cancer. But it's, it's interesting in one way in that people who have thyroid cancer, you can get multiple tumors in your thyroid at the same time. And they can actually be different types of tumor. So what I did was I took the cells from the different types of tumor and I profiled the microRNAs to see if there were differences, and indeed there were. And so there have been a lot, there's been a lot of work in cancer to see are there, there are differences between them, but the, between the different cancers. And that's all well and good. They're using them to maybe classify the different cancers and maybe figure out what a, a difficult to diagnose cancer is. But I told you that they regulate a huge amount of genes, so what are they actually doing? And that's very cell specific as well, and so we can use different methods in the lab to figure out what they're doing. We can use computer programs to try to predict what they're doing, but that's kind of tricky. What we can do is artificially inject them into cells and then look at the genes and proteins that change to see if that's important. We can look at the cell behavior to see if they grow more quickly um, or more slowly, etc. And so that's kind of what I did in, in, my, in the rest of my PhD, but even further than that, to make them more interesting in the cancer context is that in 2008 a paper came out that showed that we could detect them in blood and in, in what they call liquid biopsies. And so these are pretty good for um, cancer diagnosis um, because I, I'm sure you might be aware of the PSA test for prostate cancer. Um, everybody would prefer to have a blood draw and a test for cancer rather than something more invasive. And so when I finished my PhD, I moved to another university in Dublin, and we decided to look at this in the context of colorectal cancer. And we got samples from 
patients who didn't have cancer, who had benign cancer, and early stage and late stage cancers. And we looked at uh, a whole load of RNAs, in, micro RNAs in them. And the nice thing about these is that you can, you can take um, somebody's blood and boil it, you can throw acid in it, you can freeze it and thaw it and everything, and they're still going to be there. So that makes them, that's why everybody got super excited about this. We're, and, and especially in the, in the context of colorectal cancer, which was my project at the time, instead of actually having to get a colonoscopy, wouldn't you much prefer just, like, just take my blood and then tell me later on? Um, and so we did, we found some interesting changes in the disease groups, but nothing really that um, I would say was robust enough to maybe bring further. What really needs to happen with that um, now is that other groups need to replicate the study in additional samples. We had samples from Dublin and from Prague, but we need, we, I had 150 samples. We need way more than that to see if, if, if they're true, if they're, if they're true markers. And so I, I published that study and then decided, okay, that was great. It was a really patient focused, um, but I'd like to go back to some mechanism. And that's, that's what brought me back, brought me to here to work in Moffat. Um, and I, I joined, I wrote a fellowship and joined the Lynch group. And what they do is study when cancer spreads to the bone. And why, why this was really compelling to me is because most people who pass away of cancer don't pass away of their primary tumor, it's when it spreads to somewhere else in their body. So this group studies in detail when it spreads to the bone. So what I'm trying to do in Moffat is to look into microRNAs that might be promoting prostate cancer in particular from spreading from the prostate into the bone and what they're doing in the bone. And then in conjunction with that, taking blood samples from people in Moffat um, and urine samples sometimes, which are super gross, but I do it. Um, I'll just say one word on that, sediment. Yeah, not good for a Monday. Okay, um, so what I want to do though is take, take blood samples and any other liquid biopsies and, and look for microRNAs in those um, to see if we can help with um, prostate cancer diagnosis because prostate cancer like thyroid cancer is actually not a super aggressive cancer. You can, you can be diagnosed with this and actually have no treatment in, in what we call watchful waiting. But there's a particular group of people who are in this watchful waiting, but we don't know whether the cancer will progress to be aggressive or whether it'll be more benign and just stay there. And so what I'd really like to do is, is figure out if I can find some microRNAs that will mark out the people who have aggressive treat or who have aggressive cancer to mark them for more aggressive treatment or people who just need to be left alone and, and don't need to be interfered with um, because some of the treatments really have, have pretty negative side effects. So I, I don't know how long I've been talking for there, but so um, I'm, I'm going to wrap up and I hope what I have um, communicated to you is how um, important and uh, I suppose wide widely impacting microRNAs are in biology in general, but particularly in cancer as well. And also that um, in science, we don't really have many eureka moments. And then if you have a eureka moment, you could be looking at a worm's arse. So it's not the most <laughs> glamorous profession. And that's it. I'll take any questions you guys have. question was, can you look at the microRNAs and tell what cancer yeah. it is? So um, yes and no. Um, there are certain microRNAs that are kind of a common to all cancers. So there are microRNAs that are tumor promoting in general. And, and then there are other microRNAs that would be more specific to a cancer type. So there is a lot of work um, looking at all the microRNAs. So there are about two and a half thousand human microRNAs discovered. And what they're trying to do is, is utilize those to be a diagnostic tool, to be more specific. And what they're also doing is um, trying to use them as potential treatments. So there are a couple of 
um, clinical trials actually out there now. So one of them is um, trying to use uh, a microRNA therapeutic as a replacement therapy. So the really cool thing about these is they regulate 100 or more targets. So if we can figure out how to clinically modify and manipulate one of them, it's going to be much more powerful than just taking a normal like protein-based drug because that's just targeting one thing. If we can, if we can target a microRNA, we can, we can target a whole system or network of genes that are altered. So there are, are kind of two approaches to that. One of them is to replace the microRNA, a tumor suppressive microRNA that's been lost. And there's a phase one clinical trial on that um, in liver cancer. And then the other approach is if there's a toxic microRNA, a really potently toxic one present, can we get rid of that? Can we, can we sequester it away out of the cell so that the cell can like function more normally? So that there's, there's actually a phase two trial, so that's like one up better than a phase one, but that, actual, that therapy is for hepatitis C. And they have shown that if you just um, inject this compound that has uh, an inhibitor for the microRNA, it's a particular microRNA, it's 122, that you can really, really effectively reduce hepatitis C levels. And as a side effect, reduce cholesterol, so like bonus. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some really exciting things, but it's very um, early. So science moves really slowly. So it really only, people started studying this in humans uh, I know it sounds like a long time, but 16 years ago, but on average it takes um, about 10 years for a drug to get from basic research to the clinic. But there, there's really promise for, for both diagnostics and therapeutics with them. Is there a connection between the thyroid and the thymus? There is. They're, they're involved in kind of like the whole metabolism regulation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the strange thing about thyroid cancer is that an, uh, an awful lot of people will die with thyroid cancer and never know they'll have it. I mean, it, it came into the news after um, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and, and it was much more common after that fact. But in general, um, you're, you're probably going to be fine if you have thyroid cancer. There is a, a, a subset, a very, very, very rare um, type of thyroid cancer that's pretty aggressive. But apart from that, you'll be okay. And I, that's something that I don't think is kind of talked about enough in cancer talks is that it's, it's very fatalistic sometimes. Like, people are okay. Like, it's not a death sentence anymore, especially with therapeutic um, advances and a lot of the research going on. If you catch it early, like, you're, you're probably going to be okay. Anybody? I think that's it, yeah. Thanks guys, if you want any other questions later, just ask me.